This is back to back. Yo, what's up, back to backers? This is Willie Joy. Welcome to the show. This is back to back. This is my podcast. If I sound a little hoarse right now, I just flew in, uh, got back home this morning, played a great show in San Jose last night. I'm back home now, back in the saddle, and my guest today on the show is Tosoki. Right now, Tosoki is touring North America on the Hyper Future Tour with Must Die and Lax. You got to go check them out. All super talented guys, great people, great friends. And if you're listening to this on the release day, Tosoki's new track, Bring It Back, just dropped on Monster Cat yesterday. Brand new heat. Before we get into that, I would be remiss if I didn't remind you guys about our Spotify playlist called Back to Bangers. If you want to hear any of the music that we talk about on this show, you got to go subscribe to that playlist. It's updated every single week. I promise you'll hear something dope that you've never heard before. The link to go check that out is in the description of this episode. I also want to make sure you guys are subscribed to this show. I don't want you to miss an episode. We got some really good ones coming up. So make sure you just click the little subscribe button on whatever platform you use to listen. And each week, the new episode is just going to pop up on your device and you don't ever have to worry about missing another one. You can always reach out to me at backtobackpod at gmail.com. Send me your questions. Send me your thoughts. Write me a poem. Send me your best soup recipe. You know, all the normal stuff that people send each other. And if you really enjoy this show, if you like what you're hearing, if you want to hear more, the best way you can support us is by telling a friend We don't do a lot of advertising. I don't think we've actually ever done advertising for this show. So the way we spread, the way we grow is by word of mouth. And you can also leave us a rating and a review in iTunes as well. As always, your support is very appreciated. So for this episode with Tosoki, I was really looking forward to it because honestly, I didn't know him very well. I like his music a lot. I think he's one of the most talented up and coming producers right now. You know, I think he's mostly known for dubstep and probably if you're listening and you're a producer, you know his sample packs as well, but he's actually got a ton of range. Uh, Some of his most recent non-dubstep songs have really caught my ear. I just think a lot of what he's doing is kind of a breath of fresh air. And he's also doing production for a lot of other artists, probably some of your favorite artists, uh, just under the radar. But suffice to say, he's a talented guy. We vibed really well. It was a great conversation. His story, kind of his whole come up is really interesting. And I think he's just got a really good perspective on his whole career. Even though he's still in the process of building it, still an up and comer, he kind of speaks with the authority of a veteran. And, you know, you listen to his music, I think it's pretty well deserved. And I'm going to link to all of his music, all of his tour dates, everything in the description of this episode. I don't want to go on too long, though. I want to let you guys hear this conversation. So let's get into this right now. This is me and Tosoki back to back. Let's go. So the last time I saw you, you were looking for an apartment in L.A. Oh, yeah. Did you find one? Do you got a place to live now? Yeah. I moved in with my girlfriend, but she lives in like a like a big house with like five other people. Oh, okay. Is that is that awkward? Is that I feel like that'd be a strange situation, even if it is your girlfriend. Yeah. I mean, we all get along and like no one's ever there. Oh, Because like everyone kind of works away from home. Yeah, it seemed like a fucking hassle when I saw oh, you last time, man. It's horrible. Because like, cause I'm only on a visa as well. It's like I can't apply for a, a tenancy. Yeah, with, wait, how does that work? What kind of a visa do you have right now? It's called an O-1 visa. Okay. And it's for, inverted commas, like um, 
extraordinary ability in the arts and sciences. Oh yeah, it's one of those like uh, so. What somebody had to like write you a letter or something saying yeah. that. I had to get like You're cool. Yeah. <laughs> I had to get like recommendation letters from like all the like big labels and like artists I worked with. I remember someone from like back home in the UK. I won't name names, but like he he'd come out here, done like a tour on like a tourist visa or like a right. I think it's called an Esther or something, and uh, earned a load of money, and uh, yeah, because he he didn't declare it and he did none of that stuff. He he got found out. All the money got took off him. Oh, got banned for ten years. Uh, and then he had to pay a fine. And I'm not sure if he did like jail time. Or Damn, he was like faced with jail time. Damn, but, that's so intense, yeah. dude. I was that scared the life out of me. Oh my god, because yeah. I mean, it, as U.S. artists, uh, there's a lot of stories of like when you go to Canada for the first time, a lot of people will try and sneak in or just like be like, ah, I'm not working, I'm just visiting, all that. And I had uh, more than a few friends who got caught in that. And with Canada, if they catch you, I mean, it's not that extreme, but yeah, I think you're, it's like banned for five years or something. And Oh, worth it. No, it's really not, man. I had one like very, very early on in my career where I went to Canada to play a show without the like the proper paperwork. Yeah. And even then, I mean, I did it, it was fine, but I was just so stressed. Always and, watching your back and oh stuff. My and God, like, yeah. yeah, after I did it the one time, I was like, I'm never, ever doing that again. Because they, they like they watch your like, social media and stuff as well, right? So yeah, if you, even yeah. if you post a picture and it's like, you tag the venue, they're like, what the fuck? Oh yeah, and they'll, they'll Google you, they'll like find the flyer for the show. Um, I'm good, I'd rather <laughs> just like do it the proper way. Yeah. <laughs> So you were here on this visa, and now you're trying to turn it into like a permanent resident visa. Yeah, I mean it's such a it's such a confusing situation because pretty much to to people who don't understand, it's like if you're earning in America on like a on like a work visa, which which is what this is, and you're a foreigner, thirty percent of all your earnings gets withheld because it's like foreign earning tax right right so everything that i make outside of like europe gets withheld by america like 30 percent of it business aspect like um management takes a cut booking agent takes a cut and that's already like not a lot but like quite a bit and then it's like oh 30 percent on top of that and yeah. then it's like california is seven percent state tax <laughs> and it's just like i'm walking away with like nothing after like most things so it's yeah it wouldn't be like a lifestyle thing because you know with what like we do and stuff is we just travel all the time. Right. But it's more like a paperwork legality. Like would make your life easier. Yeah. yeah. I that. tried to explain it to my mom. She was like, Oh, you're just moving away, like going away like forever. And I was like, No, <laughs> it's just like a tax thing. But, right. Yeah. Is your mom still out in the UK? Yeah, she's she's out there grinding on her own. What part of the UK are you from? Uh so I'm from uh, a city called Norwich, which is um just outside of Cambridge, which is more well known, I feel like I just say to people that I'm from Cambridge. It's sure, just, it's just down the road. It is Norwich like a, a small town? It's like a small city. Okay, I have no comparison American wise to compare it to because it's just completely different. But it's yeah, it's, it's about the same size as Cambridge, but Cambridge is more well known for like sure. University. Sure. What does your mom do? Speaking of your mom, uh, she currently works at the hospital doing some kind of admin job. I'm not too sure the technicalities of it. Um, yeah. But it's to do with like I think it's to do with like ear, nose, and throat. That part of people's health. Sure. Um, yeah, my mom's a doctor, so yeah, I'm not too sure. The hospital system is and all of its complexities are familiar. Yeah, to me. I just she's like, I'm going to the hospital to work, and I'm like, okay. Yeah, <laughs> sounds about right. Yeah. Were you musical growing up, or was your family musical at all? Uh, my family wasn't musical at all because I went to a a school that like specialized in uh like performing arts so like drama and art and music mm. was that something you wanted to do or is that something your family kind of directed you towards I, honestly i think it was like just the nearest school to where we were oh, okay and it's like a lot of the kids who were because in the uk it's like first school middle school and then high school and the majority of the kids from my area it was just like a natural progression to go from the middle school to that high school oh interesting um yeah i've got some friends who are like actors and like artists and like a lot of the people I grew up around 
do that kind of thing now because of the school that we went to. But That's, yeah, you know, I always think about that, especially in the U.S. right now. Public education is sort of under attack, and and certainly there's not a lot of funding being thrown around for arts programs of any kind. And I went to sort of just a regular high school. It wasn't arts focused, but it was, I mean, it was a nice private school. They had a lot of money. And so, you know, all of those extracurriculars were available to me. But I think about it, I mean, do you think being in that program, in that environment helped you or at least made you think more seriously about, you know, continuing on in the arts? Yeah, I think, I think it played a big part in it. There was also like, like Green Day. I used to like obsess over like Billy Joe Armstrong. Oh yeah, and like Green Day, the the Dookie album was oh, like, yeah. dude, one the that was for me one of the first times where like music really changed my brain. Yeah, you know, I don't know what it was about that album in particular. Maybe just the right time it hit me. Yeah, but man, yeah, I was obsessed. Yeah, it was like the perfect amount of like adolescence for like however old I was. <laughs> and like I just remember watching like I had like one of the DVDs. Or I think it was the American Idiot like live DVD. And I was just like, damn, I want to do that. So then I like, I like picked up a guitar, like a really cheap guitar and like had guitar lessons and then kind of self-taught, like I didn't really go to the lessons anymore. And it just kind of went from there. Interesting. Yeah. Were you writing songs, like doing original stuff off the bat? Not completely off the bat. It was just like scale practices. Yeah. And like, just important. Yeah. Just like cover songs and like, it was always like Blink-182 and like. Billy Talent and like things like, <laughs> right, like right. those kind of bands. You're you're heavy into the pop punk. Vibe. Oh yeah, I was I was obsessed with it. Was there any of that in the UK? I mean, I, I'm sure like they're obviously they got play in the UK. Yeah. But was there anything like that in the UK? I'm kind of ignorant. No, not that I can remember. I, I I mean, at least I've got some friends who would who would shoot me for like not paying attention to it. But like <laughs> the stuff that I was focused on was like more like stateside like american stuff yeah i know there was a few bands i can't remember their names but they were because of the way like the uk is it's like you either make or break it and most of those bands are, like broken on now yeah know? yeah that's interesting too i mean i we'll get to this later but i that idea of sort of you know the glass ceiling in oh, the yeah. uk and it being this sort of contained closed system yeah it's always been really interesting to me you know now we're kind of getting uh, getting ahead of ourselves but you even think about something like dubstep or dance music in general you know it was born in the u.s then when we kind of set it off to the uk you guys made it you know 20 million times better and sent it back to us yeah. and that then we loved it you know and it's yeah. the uk has always been on sort of the forefront of really interesting progressive music i think did you feel personally like later on when you were you know becoming an artist yourself did it feel confining to be in the UK? Did it feel like there was a, like eventually you'd have to get out of there? Yeah, like it was always like, what was the next step going to be? Like I was in a few bands growing up and that was never a concern with that kind of, that kind of stuff. Interesting. What kind of bands? Like metal bands. Oh, sick. And like, I was in metal bands. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she was so cool. It was the best, man. Yeah, I kind of missed that vibe. And, it, and it's it's weird too because especially with dubstep i mean metal is is coming into it a little bit yeah, and, and there's yeah. you know actually with guys like Sullivan King and whatever i mean there's actual metal acts but that's all to say that for me i don't think anyone's nailed that metal vibe yet like i don't know phase 1 dude phase 1 is fucking yeah no phase 1 is sick yeah, I just feel like, I, for me, it's like I want the vibe of like when I was coming up list like old, you know, Sepultura and early Slipknot yeah. and, you know, just like the really crazy shit that still kind of had a groove to it, you know? Uh, our band, like when we were kids, like I remember like covering uh, Heretic Anthem. Oh, yeah. And like some like uh, like guitarists, like garage or garage as you guys call it right. it's just like as kids like just scream like five five, five. <laughs> yeah so good. your parents must have loved that oh yeah <laughs> yeah they were all about it well i mean you know growing up it seems like they were pretty supportive of you being involved in the arts and uh, yeah. pretty encouraging overall is that fair to say yeah i mean um i grew up without a dad so it was uh it was just my mom mm. and i'm an only child as well oh, okay yeah uh, same yeah, I do. I read some like crazy stuff about being an only child. Read, what did you read? Let's get into it. Part of it was like 
you find I took screenshots and I sent it to all my friends and like yeah. just explain it. I was like, I was like crying. I was like, I'm so sorry. Like part of it was like only children look at friendships as if they're siblings. And they get into deeper friendships and hold friends at a higher level yeah. because they're not used to having like people around them. Because like that's interesting. As you're an only child, you you like apart from school, you only like interact with adults, right? Yeah. So it's like you're used to being like around older people, but right. like then people your own age, you just like see them as oh, dude. That's so funny. Yeah. No, that's interesting. I never thought about that, but I mean, if I think about my own life, yeah, that's I can see it, man. Yeah, for sure. It was. I won't find the screenshots because it's gonna take. Long, <laughs> no, it's it all was good. Like, yeah, it's weird. That's interesting though. Yeah, I mean, I like that because I think, yeah, that for me, that's true because I would find, I would form really close friendships like, mm-hmm. and there was kind of no in between for yeah. me. Like I didn't have like casual friends Oh yeah, really. that's how I feel now. I've got like, I've got like a handful of close friends who I know that like any time of the day, any situation, I can call them or they can call me and it'll be like non-judgmental. Like if someone like fucks up on something, we'll like call them out on it or like, yeah. Or like no matter how much like success or anything, like you know that you're just friends. Right. But like years and years ago, I'd always like question myself. I'd be like, because I've had the same friends for ages. And yeah. I, I'd always question myself. I'd be like, do I hold them at like a higher, closer standard than they hold me? Yeah. And I would like, it would just fuck my head up. Dude, I mean, I experienced the same thing in the music industry, especially earlier in my career where I would like really hold somebody in high regard, really think, yeah. you know, like, and really try to like help them in whatever way I could. And then, you know, with certain people, it wasn't reciprocated in the same way yeah. that I had just sort of naturally assumed it would have been. And I put that on myself. Like, I think it's my fault for kind of just misreading how normal relationships right. in this business work. Yeah. But I, yeah, I mean, maybe it does go back to that only child thing for sure. Someone, someone tweeted about that. I can't remember if it was like BT. Or someone like ages ago, and he what was it like Cascade or someone, someone of that caliber, right? And that helped like I can't remember if it was Paul Robinson, might have been Paul Robinson, but he basically was just like, I put you on, dude. Like I helped you with all this shit. Like why aren't you like doing it back? Blah, blah, blah. Mm. And it's just like, yeah, I definitely see like the and he put it out there publicly. Yeah, he put it on Twitter. Ooh, I can't, man. I can't remember. Someone will find it, but I can't remember who it was. But they were just like calling them out, like left, right, and center, yeah. and it was wow. just like. That's messy, man. Yeah, stay away from that shit. <laughs> yeah, even if that's the way you feel, posting that on Twitter is not a yeah. good look. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I I post my thoughts on Twitter, like, but I, I wouldn't like bring personal shit on Twitter. Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah, I mean, I I think personal, like being personal and personable on Twitter is kind of what it's for. Yeah, but it's it's more just like. You know what? In that situation, what are you gonna gain out of it? Like yeah, the guy's not gonna say, "Oh, you're right. I'm sorry." <laughs> yeah, and just like flip the mood or anything. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's strange. How long have you been in the states for? Like an extended period of time. Uh, like when did you get the the talented visa or whatever you call it? Oh, it was such a long process. Really? Yeah, it was like first time I came out was like I think it was August last year. Me and like my friend Ray Ray Volpe. He yeah, makes music on the shout out to Ray. Little shit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, you beat him on this podcast. He, we were supposed to get together last week and do his episode, yeah. and then he—I uh, won't say flaked out, but he—he he couldn't do it. It just—he'd so. just be promoting what other chain restaurant he's addicted to. <laughs> I think it's Chipotle right now. <laughs> yeah, they, he, I know he gets a lot of money from them for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, like last August, um, we did like a festival back to back. That was funny. We played like a venue called DNA Lounge as well. Yeah. Oh, I know DNA in San Francisco. Yeah, yeah it wasn't yeah. it wasn't the greatest. That place, like, I haven't been there in a long time. It used to be like the spot, you know, years yeah. and years and years ago. But yeah, I haven't been back in a long time. It was very, it was a very strange setup. Um, it was a cool show, and like, thankful for the people putting us on and stuff. But uh, right, but yeah, we played a, a festival called Toxic Summer mm-hmm. the day after. Like the the like pre party was in DNA Lounge. Yeah, after that, went home. And then a couple of months at home, and then back out, did like a run of shows uh, around Halloween, and then back home, back out again. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, yeah, I, the longest I've stayed out here bar this time before that was uh, for December. I just came out for the whole month. I didn't I didn't book a flight home, and then uh, right. I, f- I flew home on like Christmas Eve. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So, so being here for these longer periods is still relatively new. I kind of like lock myself away though, so I don't really like notice much of like the culture shock. Aspects, right, but. right, yeah. And it sounds like if you already had some pretty strong friendships before yeah. coming over here, that would probably tide you over. Yeah. Because I feel like if you, you know, if you came 
from a, another country, really anywhere, to LA to you know do music and didn't have a strong base of you It'd know be so support. isolated. Oh my I'd god, I'd hate it. I'd, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, do you kind of get into the LA scene? Um, like, I try not to. Yeah. I, before like moving here, probably I stayed up in uh, stayed up in like North Hollywood, Studio City area for like the duration of my stay, like on my friend's couch, and it was like. I tend not to like get involved with the drama, but I could feel myself getting sucked, <laughs> like sucked into right, it. Right, you can't just help because of the certain... valley and yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I feeling that pressure to go out every night, yeah. and you know, this famous person is at this place, so we should go here. All of that, just another fucking person. Yeah, I it's agree, like, man. I yeah, agree. I, I definitely got sucked into it, especially like the first time I came here. Like a lot of friends were like playing shows, and I'd be like, oh, I'll just go along, and then like. I would always see the same people there and it was like, this clearly just isn't doing yeah, anything. Yeah, it's a dead end after a while. That's oh, the yeah. weirdest thing. It, you know, when I first moved to California, I wanted to move to LA and it didn't work out and I ended up in San Diego, which at the time, I was like, it was cool. I love it here. But yeah. I was like, I'd rather be in LA. And now yeah. that I've been here long enough, I'm like, you know, this is actually probably way better for me. Yeah. Because I would have fallen into the same thing out oh, there. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's very childish as yeah. well. I mean, like, a lot of people talk about it and like use it to like benefit themselves, but like the from the start of like doing music, it was always like I'm I'm quite an introverted person, yeah. and my like end goal has always been like to lock myself away in like a studio and just write tons of like music, whether it be for myself or like other people or mm. like singers and stuff. It was it was never to be like stand on a stage in front of people with my arms up in the air with like pyrotechnics. Yeah, you know? of course. Well, and you know, so from playing in bands when you were younger, how did you get into electronic production from that? It was a part of my life what which was quite rocky. Um which kind of saw Back me in the UK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of it saw me like Spend a lot more time on my own. It's like when I dropped out of school and stuff. Um, mm. When did you drop out of school? I think it was like, like 15, 16. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Worst decision in my life, but I learned from it. And was music kind of like an escape at that point? Like something you could pour your yeah, energy into? Yeah, I guess I was always like a fucking... I can swear on here, right? Oh, yeah. I guess I was always like an emo kid. Like, yeah. <laughs> like I always had like long hair and like painted nails and like wore eyeliner and shit. Right. And I just had a laptop and like... Pretty cliche bullshit, but like got FL Studio, just started diving into that. And I guess that's where it like started. Just having like, not necessity as such, but it was like the only thing that I could like eat up time with. And, you know, I mean, that's the beauty of modern electronic production, right? Is that yeah. you could be literally anywhere as yeah. long as you had that computer and that program. What kind of music did you start off making those uh, early Fruity Loop sessions? I would always like sample other people's music. Yeah. And just like, off punk it and chop it up of course man it was like mostly like wolfgang gardner i know you had him on it yeah i listened to that one that was yeah, dope he's amazing yeah i would just like sample his stuff chop it up because that was very like choppy and like yes that kind of vibe but, like electro stuff yeah yeah i was I listening mean, to like dead mice as well right yeah those two and a few other guys man i mean wolfgang was i don't think he gets enough credit in 2018 for yeah, what he did back then because he changed the game oh my god 100 percent. yeah and just such a crazy talent too. His stuff still holds up. It like, really does, yeah. man. It's so technically precise and mm -hmm. like so much more complicated than I think just a regular listener understands. Yeah, you know that's how I got into it. Before that, I because of like the whole emo phase, I'd there was this band called Enna Shikari. Mm. Don't know if you've heard of them. I know the name. Yeah, that I mean I don't really listen to them now because they've gone like quite political, and. I'm not clued up on that shit at all. Like, I, I don't know anything about that. But like right. beforehand, they'd have like a that synth called an electribe. Yeah, and like yeah. they'd like program like synth loops, and that I guess that's like what sparked like the electronic side of things. Well, growing up in the UK, I mean, electronic music. I think you guys just have a different perspective on it than we do in the states. It's very elitist. Elitist, yes. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely true. But what I was going to say is that I mean, it's also a bit more kind of just in the culture of the UK, right? Yeah. I mean, it still kind of is, but I I still think it's very disposable. Mm. People people will find something and get latched on it and it will get rinsed absolutely everywhere. And then yeah. six months later, everyone will hate on it. It's, <laughs> it's quite hard to keep up with. And especially if you're making music, it's... It's like, where do you turn to? You yeah, know? well, I mean, certainly, you know, you look at guys making heavier music right now, it's pretty tough to go play in the UK. Yeah, the only, the only people that I know that, like, 
actually sell shows in the UK as like the UKF guys and like Never Say Die guys. Right. Any other dubstep or like bass like, act. Probably like the Circus Records guys, like Flux and them. I haven't seen them do anything in the UK recently really? either, which is scary. Like I played a, I actually supported Flux with them like years and years and years and years ago, like 2012. Okay. And I think that was the last time that I can remember that they did something like that. Oh, wow. It's not even a competitive market because of like, the necessity is more the fact that anything that isn't a staple like Never Say Die or UKF is just goes unnoticed, which mm. really fucking sucks. What is popping there right now for for dance music? Oh. I mean, drum and bass is still big, right? Yeah, that's got like an underground vibe though. Like that, yeah. that will never go away. Like I have a I have a close friend who makes like jump up. I love drum and bass, man, but it to me and God, I'm gonna get some angry people uh, after I say this. But <laughs> the, every year, people are like, "This is the year when drum and bass is gonna break into the states." It's go never make, gonna. It's never, never gonna happen. There's no uh, way. But it doesn't need to, because Europe and UK have such a strong love for it, and whatever, what like what I've noticed is whatever happens, music wise. In the UK, drum and bass is always going to be the underlying tone, you know. Yeah, like it's it seeped in and out of pop music a lot. Yeah, it's always there. Yeah, it's so strong as well. Yeah, it is, man. It's it's that kind of culture I'm, I'm sort of impressed with, and the fact that it's on the radio, yeah. and, and all of that. You know, when you were growing up, what about the rise of dubstep? How did you experience that being in the UK? Like the first in school, there was uh, in like an IT class. We had a very like young. I think it's probably like. He was like my age. I'm 23 now. Yeah. So he was, he was, I think he was around 23, 24. He'd have like a MacBook Pro. First of all, I was like hella jealous of anyone who had a fucking... Because <laughs> right. I had like a really like old... It's like a power book or like an iBook. Oh, yeah, One yeah, of those yeah. like old ones. And he'd have like this glossy like MacBook Pro. Right, yeah. It's so like funny, man. Because the older, the older Mac laptops just look like toys now. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I was in an IT class and I don't know, like... I think it was because like the stuff that was going on at home, but he kind of took like a favoritism to me and like he'd he'd play me like Roscoe things like off his iTunes and like we were working on like these old Windows PCs and he, he would put his laptop next to me and like plug in headphones and I would like I had like Roscoe and stuff on his laptop yeah. and then uh yeah that was how I kind of like first heard about it and my friend had a had a copy of the like Skrillex remix of a band called Twin Atlantic okay and they were Scottish. So it was like, oh, the little little, connection. Yeah, yeah, and I was like, this is like fucking crazy. <laughs> but that was like the first like time I heard it. When Scotland had, I mean, was there anyone locally kind of that you could look to for sort of an example of like a, a successful Not really. artist? Yeah. When I started getting more into it, at least like Hudson Mohawk. Right. Rusty. I think they were on a label called Lucky Me. Yeah, they were. Yeah. A lot of the Lucky Me guys were inspirational in a way just of the way that they were from there and they had like made a thing out of it yeah they made like a pretty strong yeah scene. they still got a strong scene like they they, yeah. they sell out like shows like all the time in scotland but past that i didn't really follow much of it they were inspirational to me man because and still are because it really seemed like they were just doing exactly what they wanted to do yeah. and then once it got popular they didn't really care that much and, yeah. and didn't change what they were doing to try to make it more palatable for anybody. Yeah, it's a lot like uh, Cohen Sound. Mm, yeah. Um, we used to be on like inadvertently the same kind of management in a weird way. Like my manager was their manager's assistant. So oh, okay. Like, like, There's but, a connection. Yeah, yeah. but they, they would always like do what they wanted. Like they wouldn't, they would only say yes to shows they really, well, they still probably do. I would right. say yes to shows they only really wanted to do and like, and I remember too when when Cone Sound, you know, started getting noticed, you know, Skrillex was putting them on, they yeah. were coming out on Ausla, and everyone was really excited. And then they just kept making their weird ass awesome. Well they wanted to do, yeah. Yeah. And you know, and I think maybe the public eye moved on from them. Yeah. But to me, those are inspiring. That's stories way more to admirable yeah, than to like man. just change with the current flow. It's way more better to be like, okay, we're in the spotlight, we're just gonna stay doing the same shit. Right. And I'm sure, you know, their core fans are just die hard for whatever they do yeah. because they know that they're getting that kind of pure, unfiltered art yeah know? it's it's way it's it's like i see friends like i'd much rather have like a stronger fan base of more loyal fans who would just be happy with me making whatever makes me happy rather than like tons of people who 
oh my god, bro step. Like, <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like screechy sounds and shit. It's yeah. like, I mean, it's the same way I free, see friends. Like, I'd much rather just have a handful super close to me rather than like people I need to like impress all the fucking time. Yeah, you know? no, 100%, man. And, and for you, you know, so once you were making, you know, figuring out Fruity Loops, making these these early tunes, when did it start to get serious for you or when did you have the idea that maybe it could be more than you know a hobby or something you were doing at um, the time i don't really remember a specific point but it was i remember like there was there was a website i don't know if they still run it i think it's just edm.com now but like okay. dubstepped on that oh yeah yeah i think edm.com like took over all those right. sites and consolidated them. yeah, yeah I can, something like that i can never keep up with that uh, shit yeah me neither but yeah like i i go a few songs on like dubstepped on that and i was like oh this is cool like a few thousand plays blah 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 and uh yeah i just kept doing it and like just kept putting shit out, like reaching out to like YouTube promo channels. I didn't have really any goal. Mm -hmm. I wasn't like, I want to blow up. I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to get played by these people. I was just like making it and just doing like the same process, like building up a relationship with like the A&Rs that like dubstep on that. And like, right. Yeah. I never, I never had like a specific point. Hmm. It's weird you should mention that because I've never thought about that. Yeah. I, it's, I always wonder, I don't think you necessarily have to. Yeah. I mean, for me too, it was sort of a, it was something I always loved doing and something I always did because I liked it, but it wasn't until I lost a job that I had yeah. and then couldn't get another job and had to make money off of music just to pay my rent. Out of necessity. Yeah, yeah. That, that's what it was for me, you know, and, and had I not lost that job at that time, you know, it could have been totally different. Yeah, I remember like I was on like, I think you guys call it welfare out here. Mm -hmm, in, the, yeah. in the UK, it's called job seekers allowance. And pretty much it's like, the government will give you an allowance of money if you're unemployed and like active. You need to prove that you are applying and searching for jobs right. to be able to get this allowance. So the second I turned 18, um, like a lot of 18-year-olds who do the creative stuff, I went straight onto it. Um, it's frowned upon by society because like, blah, 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 people exploit it. Yeah, of course. Because people are fucking shit. Right, right. Um, <laughs> I went on it and uh, you, every two weeks you have to go to uh, the job center, inverted commas, and have a meeting with like um, the person who like takes care of like your cases. Right. My guy was a fucking godsend. <laughs> really? He was he he his son. Uh, I think his son played guitar in like quite a big band or whatever. I can't remember. Oh, so he kind of got it. Completely got it. I'm not gonna name anyone because I could get him in trouble. But like he would always like fill out the sheets for me, and he said on the way walking here, write down like the shops that you walk past, and we'll just say that you apply for jobs in them. <laughs> and he knew exactly what I wanted to do. Like I'd express him, I was like, I want to like do music full time. I just want to like be in like the artistic space and like my own boss and all this kind of yeah. shit. And he completely got it. And I was like so thankful because there were so many people around me who just like got shot down with that kind of thing. Yeah. But yeah. Those people, those moments, man, those are some of the most important. He know? saved my life. He's yeah. He straight up saved my life because otherwise, if he didn't believe in me and I, I had no funding to live, Right, I would have been fucked. And right, I, and I mean, maybe it would could have even been the reverse of my situation where you ended up in a job that you didn't want. I, I definitely you know, would have out I, of necessity. I've never worked like a normal nine to five or whatever job. Yeah, because of him, and yeah. that's that's fucking dope. No, it's incredible, man. Yeah. Shout out to that guy. As you kept going, uh, you know, with that assistance and with his help and all of that, what was the first kind of bigger cosigner or, or, you know, sort of bigger entity to notice what you were doing and kind of help you get to the, the next level, whatever that might have been? It was definitely Borgo. He was, I think he's still his close friends. There's another guy called Dan Farber. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Killer guy. So good at songwriting. He's more into that field now. He's not really doing like solo okay. stuff, but... um. They both followed me on SoundCloud. I looked at my notifications and they'd obviously just sat in like the Bygor office together and like found my SoundCloud. Right. Yeah, that happened. Went down to like a studio in London and uh, made some stuff. I don't think I ever like got finished, but he was definitely the first one who like put me on. Lovely guy. Did he, did Bygor release some of your music? Yeah, so that? it was it was a bit of a weird sub. I never, I never signed in anything like exclusively to them. I just always did free downloads and like um, they would always just promote it. Yeah. And put it out. As by Gore, I guess, like, right through their socials and stuff. And did you notice a bump from that? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because me and uh, me and Borgo like worked on a remix together um, of his song "School Days." That was like years ago, and that came out on a uh, Armada, which already was. Oh, that's big. Yeah, it's very weird because like obviously they're more of like a trans house label and like right. uh, 
like screaming dubstep song and that everyone hated it <laughs> like it was loyal to that label it's so funny when when labels do that i don't know if it's just to stay relevant or whatever yeah. like you see spinning doing that now where they're putting out you know future bass and oh, even really? some like heavier stuff um, and it, and incredible music like it's all good but i feel like the core spinning audience must just be like what are you guys doing i did a remix with someone very recently it's it's yet to come out but i think that's the originals on spinning i'm not sure if, but that's like it's like trap like hybrid like screaming like shit I don't, <laughs> right yeah, i don't know how it's gonna go down but. yeah i mean in a way it's cool it's i appreciate when labels take a chance with stuff or, oh yeah. yeah step outside of the box for you you know you're working with with borgor mm-hmm. putting stuff out on armada and some other larger labels at that yeah. point when do you start coming overseas for the first time I was touring Europe since like 2012, like way before like the Borgo Bargo okay. thing. Yeah. So how did that? Did you have a European agent, or were they just hitting you up directly? I did have a I did have a European agent for a while before the whole Bargo thing. They were the first people to put me on. It was run by a an artist called Xcore. I'm not sure if you've heard of him. Yeah, but. yeah, I know who that is. I've never met him, but I know who he is. Yeah, he he like ran a like a booking agency with his business partner. I didn't know that. Um, but he was still as like. Quite a prominent name in like the European, like Australian market. So it was, yeah, it was quite some easy of his to tunes be were like, crazy. Yeah, if he was doing a show, I would normally be put on it because of like you know working together. But, right. But yeah, that was that was Europe, and then like the first time I came out to the states was like last August. Was the first show those ones you were talking about at DNA and Toxic Summer in yeah. the states? Yeah, playing especially a, a festival atmosphere like Toxic Summer or something like that. Was that similar to other shows you had played, or was it different in the states? It was like the first time I'd witnessed like American rave culture, right? In in like Europe and like I I toured Australia before that as well, and it's it's very different. Like Australia is very similar to the UK, yeah. Like very chill, just like not p- putting like people on a pedestal. Whereas over here, it's like people see like DJs as like gods. Yeah, it's crazy, man. Yeah, I'm not into it. <laughs> I mean, I appreciate it. Like everyone, everyone has their own ways and stuff, but like. Well, and I think we're gonna see uh, a change in that culture over the next year. Or Hopefully, two. I think so. Just in the sense of that, I, I don't think it's sustainable as is because it's it's this funny thing where DJs are treated like gods, but then when you go to the festivals, it's actually sometimes kind of hard to even tell who's playing at yeah. any given time, yeah. you know, because the, the production gets bigger and bigger and the sets get more similar. It's and just more a similar. show. Right, like, exactly. It's, it's, kind not, of, it's like going to Cirque du Soleil or something. Uh, yeah. I do think that, you know, over time, people are going to want a return to kind of the more the more personal touch the more intimate vibe yeah i played a show in uh in sydney australia at a venue called world bar or like- oh world bar yeah i played world bar yeah tiny so fun best show i've ever done yeah dude it was incredible yeah it's so it's so intimate like people like are literally like in your face like at first i hated it because like quite nervous <laughs> yeah but yeah i it was like insane so intimate like you could just vibe with people it was like you were in the crowd whereas like when you're doing like these bigger festivals it's like you're so isolated like there's like thousands of people in front of you but you're like i'm like all alone up here yeah i mean you're literally hundreds of feet away from them it's terrifying not not in a sense of like nervousness or like playing a show wise but just like terrifying to think that like you're so far away from people yeah it is man and and it's harder to at least for me to feel like i'm communicating what i want to communicate exactly. to them it's not as intimate yeah. like you feel so like disconnected yeah even if it's a crazy festival with you know ten thousand people or whatever and people are having fun and you have fun there's still it's different you know yeah it's, it's not it's the just same. a different feeling yeah and I, you know, I guess the grass is always greener. Like I'm sure if I only played tiny club shows, I'd love to go play a festival sometime. But yeah. uh, doing a mix of it is very, it's very conflicting. And I guess that's why everyone's sets are like quite similar. Is because people have seen over the years that that kind of thing works to a mass audience. Because not everyone there is going to know who you are. Right. And it's as opposed to like a smaller show, like everyone's there, and you could play like anything and they'd enjoy it whereas like a big festival you, yeah. you try to please everyone yeah you, know? you try to go hard you try to go big because you know everybody else is going to be doing the same thing yeah. and you you know if you play a quieter set and then every other dj plays just balls to the wall then yeah. you're going to be the odd one out and that's why that's i think that's why like rez for example has such a has such a strong like stature is because she's she wasn't ever like afraid to like play weird shit absolutely and she has such a strong fan base now and i think that's attributed to the fact that she just obviously just wanted just to play what 
She was making and like the weird shit. A hundred percent. And it's worked out so yeah, well. Yeah, no, and and she's killing it now. Yeah. And I think she she's the proof in the pudding in a way that, you know, if you stick to your guns, because I'm sure the music that she makes and plays, the first couple times she would go to a festival, I'm sure, you know, she'd be on the dubstep stage or whatever. Yeah. And pe- it would be confusing for people. I'm sure that happened early in her career. Oh, yeah. But then she stuck to her guns and it's still killing just, it. Over time, man, she got that fan base. It's yeah, her her rise is very inspirational, I think. I mean, her whole team, like the branding of it, it's all really good. But yeah. You can tell it comes from her. It feels very authentic. Yeah, if the if the music wasn't there, then the brand would just be a brand, you know? Absolutely. What about you? Because I think, you know, a lot of people would consider you part of the dubstep scene primarily. Everyone would. Right? Yeah. But then you have all this other music and these other styles that you've made. And and even recently, yeah. you know, a lot of uh, like garage influenced stuff. Yeah. And that to me, like the first time I heard Haunted by You yeah. and the, uh, what was the remix you did for, was it? Away, Sleepwalker, Sleepwalker, yeah. yeah, that one. It just gave me goosebumps, man. I was like, holy shit! Thanks. Like the range. I don't know, man. I I feel like a lot of heavy bass producers don't have that kind of range. Yeah, I've 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 always made everything. It's never been like I think I feel like that's why I've never signed exclusively. Mm. It's because I'll I'll never be happy to like make one thing and yeah. continuously do it. I mean, obviously, the majority of the stuff that's been released is like the dubstep stuff, but. Do you like being associated? I mean, obviously, you're good at making it. You like to make it. Uh, do you like being associated with that world? I used to a lot. Yeah. Because I used to listen to it a lot, but I never listened to that shit anymore. Yeah. I listened to like Muramasa and like Weathen and like Louis the Child and like all that kind of like chilled stuff. Right. More musical. Like, I think like just as I've gotten older, it's like teen angst has gone away of course yeah well and you got to progress uh uh, you know just like a human progresses in their life i think an artist has to as well yeah i I, and also with the current state of like the the dubstep bro step whatever people fucking call it train it's like someone said to me i can't remember who it was there's nothing lyrical or there's not really anything lyrical or memorable the only the only memorable thing is like the pre-drop vocal right so you've got this like whole space of like Melody build up, old movie sample, hi hat fucking sample. You know what I mean? Yep, I know exactly what you mean. Memorable sample for like two seconds, if that, and then a drop. And always I've tried to like make like drops that you can like hum. Mm. Like I'd always like jam it out on guitar. Yeah. Like one sound with like a riff. But for the most part, I, f- I feel like people just go balls to the wall and just like use every sound they can and it's not memorable. I agree completely and I think it's going to be tough because dubstep in the last couple of years certainly has been having a moment. I mean, it's yeah. doing pretty well. But I think just in the same way that dance music as a whole, we were talking earlier, is getting more homogenized. Yeah. I think dubstep runs the risk of that same thing because I think a lot of technically talented producers go to that kind of music the same way they used to go to drum and bass. Yeah. just It is a technical music. It's hard to make it well. But then I think a lot of people get so concerned with the technical aspect that the, there's no artistic leftover. Yeah, it's just a yeah. flex of sound design. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I've yeah. I've been trying to like not do that. Yeah. I noticed I had for a while, and then I started like working with like lyrics a lot more and more vocals, and just focusing on that kind of thing. And it's yeah, it's I worked th- out. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think yeah, there is a new generation which I would say you're a part of. I mean, we talked about Ray Volpe and and some others that yeah. you can tell there's a musicality behind this certain crew of people. There's definitely people know? who who used to. It's always the metal kids. It's always yeah. the kids who listen to metal who like will incorporate that kind of thing. And then it's, I hate to say it, but it's normally like the kids who are like jocks in high school who are just like stick to like the more like atonal, yeah, non melodic stuff. A hundred percent. And it's funny because the jocks in general who have come into dance music in the States in the last few years, yeah. the, you know, bro step or whatever you want to call it, and they exist in house music too. I mean, yeah. they're all over. It's weird because dance music should be inclusive, right? Yeah. And and we should welcome anybody who wants to be a part of it. But the reality is that, you know, dan- the origins of dance music were, it's outsider culture. You yeah. Know? It, like originally, like house music came from queer culture in the 70s yeah. in New York and in Chicago. Mm-hmm. You know, if you trace it all the way back, it it was never for jocks. Yeah, you'd you never know? think. I tweeted about this recently. I went to, I can't remember what show it was. One of my friends was playing and... 
I'd noticed like everyone everyone tweets the positivity stuff like plur like all this stuff on like Twitter. Yeah, it's great. Like if you're preaching it, practice it. Right. Are these shows like? I think I stepped on someone's shoe by accident, like in the crowd. I was like instantly apologizing. I was like, "Sorry, I didn't mean to do that." Blah blah. blah. He was just like, "You fucking prick!" Like, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, "Dude, like, you're dressed like." <laughs> I don't even want to, want to fucking say it because yeah, I'll get yeah. like vexed. But yeah. like, he just looked like the type of person who would sit on his phone and be like, "Oh, like peace, love, unity, and respect." Right. But I'm gonna fucking rip your head off if you start my <laughs> shoes again. And it was just like, okay, like, yeah, yeah, I'm not about that. Just you know, be well, honest. that's a problem when the the culture blows up to the point where it gets commodified in this festival culture. I think is that the original ideals of it and probably what the artists who make it want to convey, yeah. it gets a little lost just because everything's so big. Yeah, a lot a lot of people responded to the, the tweet saying that they were like, it's all just a show. Like right. people people preach it online and stuff, but then when they're actually there, they, they don't give a fuck. You know? Yeah, man. And and I have mixed feelings about the whole plur thing in general. I don't follow it. I don't I don't fuck with it. I yeah, yeah, I mean when I was a kid, when I was like, you know, eighteen years old and or seventeen and you know, going to raves in, in the Midwest and all of that. I mean, yeah. I was that I wore candy, all that kind of yeah. stuff. I was super all about it. But for me, I, you kind of end up realizing that it's just, it's like any other philosophy. Like I know plenty of like religious people who yeah. f- are like super religious and follow a religion that tells you to act in a certain way. And then I see them not, you know, acting in the, the exact opposite. You know, yeah. it's, it exists all throughout humanity. I think people love to sort of, be a part of something. Be a part of something and then do the the fast food version of it, right? Yeah. It is that, you know, you're like, oh, all these ideals are great. I agree with all of that. I'm going to stamp this on and then I don't have to worry about it. Yeah. When I say I don't really fuck with it, it's not because I'm against it. I mean, like, like you're saying, like. Yeah, it's like you can't argue great ideals. If, yeah. If people yeah. want to be a part of something, then that's to them. But it's the same way I view religion. Like, yeah. I, I'm not a part of anything. I don't wish to be a part of anything. But if you want to do it, then crack on. You yeah. Know? No, I'm the same way, man. I've seen religion and uh, plur and whatever else you want to call it. You know, it works out for some people. I think it's yeah. just a, for my personality, it was just never for same. me. Same. I'm just, do you. You do you. Yeah. I'll do me. <laughs> exactly. It's fine. I'm, you know. <laughs> exactly, yeah. man. Now that you're here, you've been coming to the States for, you know, what, over a year now, playing shows, you're starting to tour. Yeah. And are you enjoying the touring lifestyle? You, we were talking earlier, trying to do some more shows. You yeah. Be on the road more. I mean, I want to be on the road more because I feel like it's it's been lacking um, because of like the visa issues and stuff I right. faced before. It was like being blue balls, you know, like no, of course. getting so yeah. close to it. And like I had, I had all these fucking insane shows lined up. Like I had Palladium in Hollywood, I had Webster Hall in New York, yeah. I had like some big festival in Arizona. And I had to just pull out. It was, it was so that's, fucking That's a heartbreaker, shit. man. Yeah. So yeah, I just trying to do like as many shows as possible um, just as well because I get quite a lot of people like expressing the fact that they want to see me DJ. And that's that's cool. But when it comes to the shows, I'm not, I'm not really like a show person. I'd much rather just arrive five minutes before my set and like leave straight away. Yeah, you know? yeah, that sounds about right. Not a partier. Oh no, I, <laughs> I don't drink, I don't, I don't smoke. It's, it's just not, not for me. I've got this fucking jewel thing though. <laughs> I used to smoke. I used to smoke like twenty a day. Really? For like five years. Man. And then I quit, and then I just. Yeah, I don't know. Then they made it too easy for yeah, you. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm just like, who's on this piece of plastic now? You're not the only one, man. Yeah. Conrad got one. Did I, he I had really? A, I, had oh, a meeting, I had a meeting with Conrad. I'm going to give him so much shit. He was like, oh, I got this jewel thing. It's like an LA thing. Too. I was like, you fucking uh-huh. don't do that. Conrad. <laughs> I know you're listening to this, Conrad. Put, throw that jewel in the trash. Jewel just send it to me. <laughs> I'll take it. But it's sort of funny how it worked out, man, because... I mean, I've been aware of you and your music for years yeah. and always been a fan, but then only recently we kind of came into each other's orbit. I mean, obviously you're in LA, I'm in San Diego, we're not far apart geographically, yeah. but you ended up working with Conrad, who's also my manager, yeah. and you and I have the same booking agent, which- Mike. Yeah, which yeah. I didn't even realize until cool. recently. Yeah, Mike's a G. Yeah, yeah, shout out to Mike. Yeah. And uh, no, it was cool, man. I was happy it kind of worked out that way. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what you're going to do now that you're here. Yeah, you know? it's, I find that like once you're in like an ecosystem, you, you tend to just work with the same people. Yeah, absolutely. Like Mike and Conrad and like, 
yeah, everyone around us. Well, and I think just like you were saying with friends earlier, it's one in this business. Once you find a solid person, yeah. you got to hold on to yeah. them, man. Because exactly. you know, both you and I have had managers and agents pre oh, our yeah. current team, yeah. and you know, it didn't work out because we had to switch it. And there's shout out to them. Yeah, well, it's just crazy. I talk to Conrad about this sometimes. That it's insane how many managers and booking agents and promoters and all of that there are in the entire industry yeah. and how small of a percentage of them are actually good at their jobs. Yeah. And the same could be said for artists, to be fair. Oh, yeah. But, uh, Me and my old manager stopped working together, not because of any bad blood or anything, but he uh, he started a sample back company sometime last year and that just took off. And he, okay. had, he had like no time. Yeah. And it was like more of a mutual agreement. Like I, I wanted him to succeed in that and just kill it because he was doing so well and they're still... Shout out to Origin Sound. Okay. They're, they're fucking insane. Shout out. And we're still really close friends. He still helps me with things time to time if, if I need it. But yeah, we just mutually stopped working together because of his commitments and my commitments. And from that point up until Conrad, which I think was like, I can't remember, like January. Yeah. Um, I managed myself. Right. Horrific. It's tough to do, man. Oh, yeah. It's tough to do. I've yeah. done it as well. And, Invoicing yeah. for, and uh, like, what, what else was it? Advancing for tours. Right. I just, yeah. And... I just yeah, it was it was quite bad, but yeah, I learned definitely. a lot. I learned a lot of life lessons, and I I feel like in the future I could easily become a manager or like a booking agent. Yeah, it's because I did to all see the back all the end sides stuff. of it, right? Yeah. and then you kind of understand when you do have somebody else doing it for you, you know what their job is. Yeah. you know kind of what they're doing on a day to day basis. Yeah. I made like no music from like. It takes up a lot of oh, time, dude, right? Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. That's all I've been doing recently since me and Conrad have started working together. I've just been making like so much music. Oh, that's good, yeah, man. That's great. Well, and you know, you mentioned sample packs, and I wanted to talk a little bit about your your sort of extracurricular production activities too, because yeah. I know you you did sample packs heavy, yeah, and and you produce for other people as well, yeah. And uh, do you still do the sample packs? Not really. Yeah, it was just a substitute income, pretty much. Yeah. Um, more of a business move, not really an artistic one. Um, People are probably sad you stopped doing it, man. <laughs> Those were good packs. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's extremely lucrative. If I wanted to do it full time, I I I think I still could. Yeah, it's it was just a substitute income. It, it's fun to do, like with like a field recorder going out into like the wild and like recording things like from like your kitchen and like chopping it up. Right. Yeah. I was. It was just a, a time killer, and I I knew that I could earn money from it, and it was uh still still doing music. While earning a living, right? Yeah, absolutely. It, you know, you found a way to be involved with what you love to yeah. do that actually generated some income. Yeah, is, <laughs> it's more than a lot of people could say. Yeah, I, I honestly, if this all, if like this project gave up, I would, I would just go back to doing that full time, and I'd be happy with it. Cause right, it's, it's a fun thing to do. Yeah. And you all, I know you also produced for some other people, you know, yeah. ghost production or whatever you want to call it. How did you find that experience of just realizing somebody else's vision and, and not, you know? It was very hard. Yeah. I, I fell in love with a lot of ideas that I subsequently had to like sell on. Yeah. Um, it still happens because I'm still kind of doing it like on the side. Sure. It's like the sample pack stuff. Like when you're, when you're making like, melodic loops and things like that you just gotta like let it go and i've actually like learned to put myself into a different headspace when working on those kind of things mm. just to avoid that are you able to sort of realize that you know if you make something you really like you you can say oh i'll keep you know this is a keeper that i should hold on to yeah i've tried not to though because habits over time it'll just keep happening i'll never get anything finished yeah know? fair enough it sucks but but I figured out if I do that and the sample pack comes out, I'll just go into the sample pack and use it anyway. And right. If, if people are like, oh, he used a sample from so and so, I can just low key be like, oh, well, I fucking made it. I don't <laughs> care. Like, I do that with a lot of shit. That's a power move. Yeah. 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 <laughs> a lot of people don't know that, but I do that with a lot of shit. Really? I'll use samples from packs that I've made and people will call me out on it. And I just, I just sit there that's like, so, I made it. That's so funny, man. Yeah. <laughs> Did you find, you know, producing for other people, was it hard? not only to let the ideas go, but then to not get the credit for it? Or were you able to kind of mentally just separate, you know, this is just a job? It was more just like a monetary gain yeah. kind of thing. Um, it's still fun to do, but right. I definitely split my head about it. 
do you think it made you know because i think ghost production gets such a weird negative stigma in our industry yeah. and i i have no problem with it at all yeah. and for me I, I haven't done much but in a way it was kind of helpful to me to not get make, out of that headspace get and, out of my headspace yeah. and just make something that sounded different and yeah. not feel like it had to be cohesive with what I was doing at the time. For sure. In a weird way, it was kind of inspirational. I definitely see that. Yeah. I definitely would always step out of my own headspace and make the shit for like other things and then look back and be like, oh, well, I, I've had this idea in my head. I can finally do it or that sparked something from there. It's, right, it's like yeah. a learning curve, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. It's like uh, you know, sharpening your sword, I yeah, guess. Yeah, exactly. Something. What are you working on now, man? I mean, you said you've been making all this music. What should we expect? What should people be looking out for? I'm using a lot more vocals, working with some vocalists. How's that? Sick. It's so refreshing because I, I always viewed it as like, oh, I'm just going to be making music for me, but now you can get like writers on a song. You can get different writers, different vocalists, different like input, like not not ghost production. Like I'm, right. still, I'm still producing it. I'm yeah, still making it, but just help from other people. I've, I've got like a production assistant who... Helps me with a lot of shit. Right. It's just great to like collaborate with people. And yeah, man. Well, and you think about, you know, any of today's popular music, it's not, none of it's made by one person. Yeah. You know? Like, yeah. I think the best music is made in collaboration. Oh, absolutely. And being on the other side of it as well, like working the other side was always, I always saw like the back end and how that worked. And then I don't know. I just, I've, I've got a more open mind to it now. I used to be a lot more closed off about it. But yeah, just working with more vocalists, more of like the poppy stuff. But yeah. still keeping like some of my sound. I actually sent a few things over to Conrad. Oh, cool. Um, and he yelled at me because it was like poppy stuff, but with like a dubstep mixed down. Oh, <laughs> so yeah. I need to like distinguish that. But <laughs> the kick's too loud and yeah. all this shit. <laughs> as to Soki, as the artist, you know, where do you want to take the project? I have no idea. And yeah. I think that's like the most refreshing angle I can get on it because if I plan shit, one, if it fails, it's going to like fuck me over mentally. <laughs> right. And everyone else is going to get pissed off because it's not going to plan. And two, it's like, I feel like just natural progression is just, that's how I got into this. Mm. And I feel like if I make like a strong enough plan, it's just, it's just like routine. And I don't like that. I just like, if I wake up one day and I want to make something different, I'm going to just do it. You yeah, know? man. You got to follow the fun. Yeah. That's, that's definitely a key. Yeah. I think right now is such a weird time for, artists to make a name for themselves yeah. because I, I you're probably one of the most talented like dudes i know making the kind of music that you make i appreciate that Thank yeah you. and that's a hundred percent man yeah. but i just think about like trying to stand out now it's yeah. so different than it was very weird it's yeah. a very weird climate for all of dance music, not just dubstep, it's just Oh yeah, no, not strange. just dubstep. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, I think we're seeing a little bit of a contraction in yeah. the scene, you know? Because a few years ago, there was kind of money for anybody who could make a decent oh, yeah. track. Yeah, know? it was so it was so different to how it is now, I yeah. guess. I think that's what led me into the, the other kind of avenues of income within music. Sure. Um, and it's good to know that you have that in your back pocket, right? Yeah, I can always jump back to it. I've, I'm close friends with like the people I've worked with, so it's, right. it's always something to fall back on. But yeah, for a lot man. of people, it isn't, and that's that's scary because these kids are relying on like show fees to pay rent and to eat and stuff, and it's like that one can go away real quick. Yeah, yeah, and it's like if you don't get a show one month, it's like what the fuck are you gonna do for food? And that's that's terrifying it's, to me. Yeah, right. I get anxiety just like thinking about. Yeah, it, like right? back to when I like ran away, I I didn't have any income and I was like pretty much homeless. Um, mm. I had no money, and it was like. I never want to go back to that. Yeah. And that's always, I think that's always been the fire up my ass that's like kept me going. But yeah, that's for the driving force, yeah. For kids these days, they have like, I know a few people who have such an, a strong online presence, thousands and thousands of followers, and they're like, they're st like struggling to eat. Right. And it's like, it's terrifying. It's wild, yeah. man. How do you feel about, you know, the, the branding aspect of it and the social media aspect of it and kind of, you know, needing to be more than just the music at this point. I think it's I think it's cool that people have leveraged it, especially yeah. with guys like Marshmallow and like Slushy. They're killing it. Like yeah. Moshe Lizzy, he's done a great great job with all of his artists. Hundred percent. Yeah. Um, for me personally, I don't. I just the way I see social media is just an extension of myself. Yeah. I I don't really look. Yours at, seems pretty genuine. Yeah. I, I'm not like a. I don't like to look at myself as like a brand. I'd much rather connect on like a more personal level, just because that's how I am as a person. Right. 
obviously I slap my logo on everything. <laughs> of course. You know, but like, yeah, yeah, yeah. other than that, I don't really see myself as a brand. But yeah. for kids coming up now, it's, I mean, I've been used to this from like 2012, but like for kids coming up now, it's, must be quite daunting to have to be like, I need to be a social media manager, I need to do my own bookings, I need to be a manager, I need to do an A and R, you know. And I think like, the pro you know, a lot of kids think about that before they think about the music. Yeah. And, and then they get in trouble that way. Yeah, and the music just doesn't it's like lackluster. Right. But they've got I've seen so many kids who have such a strong brand. Like you go to Les SoundCloud and everything is like beautiful like so aesthetically pleasing yeah. but the music is just like subpar and that's the thing you know you can you can kill it on the branding side like you can do an amazing job but if the music just isn't there it's not gonna go anywhere you're nah. just gonna be another instagram page yeah exactly it's, yeah. man it's you know it, it's just not gonna work out it's a weird time i think everyone's kind of just waiting to see what's on the horizon Very str- everyone's floating I mean, it's I hope. Strange. I hope you pursue the the kind of the the garage influences and, yeah. and some of the other stuff too, man. Because I think that's very big in the UK. Yeah, like the pop stuff right now is very driven by that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, and you know, again, garage is one of those things that who knows if it could ever break into the US. Strange breaking into the US is such a weird thing. It's bizarre, man. Yeah. yeah. And it's funny because I mean now U.S. artists are trying to do it in the U.K. and Europe and having a hard time. Yeah, too. no one fucking does it, <laughs> and that's great. One thing I did want to mention before we got out of here is you know we were talking earlier about how you never signed a long term deal yeah. with labels, and some of your recent music has been self released as well. Yeah, I, I guess I wanted to pick your brain about how you felt about the label ecosystem in 2018 because you've worked with a lot of the big name labels in our yeah. little niche. You know, did you have any particularly good experiences, particularly bad experiences, or or just anything that sort of made you realize that for you what you wanted to do was not be tied down to one entity? Um, I think not being tied to that down comes to like the always moving forward in my music. But on like the more admin kind of side, I I'm a complete control freak. Mm. Like I from distribution to promotion to like all of this stuff, I just want to be not overseeing it, but like have my fingers in it. Right. So it's when and you not ha- give up that control. Yeah, well, it's, it's not so much that really, but it's. I always find with labels, it was like you'd always have their fan base, and same with like if you get like a, a premiere on like a big YouTube channel, like UKF or like other guys like Dubstep Gutter, they have such a loyal fan base that are kind of built in yeah so it's like you just tap into their fan base and it was never like sure you'd get like half a million plays on like one of these youtube channels but it would never be like half a million plays because it's you it'd be like half a million plays because it's on that channel yes and exactly I, I feel like in the current day like sure like working with labels is dope like i have i have a close relationship with most of the labels i work with but in terms of like if you just want to do it yourself you you have access to graphic designers you have access to like distribution methods like TuneCore and stuff yeah yeah and like the new one like stem yeah stem is yeah dope. i've just gotten to that promotion as well like you can pay a pr company like infectious pr i worked with those guys for like for yeah they're stuff. great they're awesome um and you just pay them and they kill it and it's like if you invested because also with the youtube stuff i'm rambling but no, with, no, with the good. with the youtube stuff you people don't realize it but if you sign it to like a YouTube channel, like a label, you lose the content ID money. Exactly. And for the most part, if you're getting like a quarter of a million plays, that same amount of money can be reinvested if you release it yourself into like a PR company yes. to get you more reach and you as like an artist more exposure. Right. It's building your own foundation versus, you know, building somebody else's. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that's a really good point is that people don't realize how important owning your own content can be. Yeah. Because if you put it on somebody else's platform, I mean you you give up the right to say what they do with it. Yeah. And a yeah. lot of like rights a lot of people like new kids coming up don't think about rights. But like to give you an example, like last year, I think it was last year, the year before. I got a self-release song. I got a sync deal with Budweiser. Mm. If I'd have released it on a label, I wouldn't have sent any of that money. Right. But because I because I self-released that song and I I work through a, a store called a Apollo Music Store. They like are my sync agents. But if I didn't do that, I w- I wouldn't have seen that deal. Or I would have got the deal. I would have been like, oh, this is cool. But I wouldn't have earned anything off it. And I right. think in today's climate, you should be owning as much as your own stuff as possible. Yeah. You know? Like obviously labels are great because they take care of a lot of the stuff yeah. that is time consuming to do, that is stressful to do. 
you know, labels like Never Say Die do an amazing job of it. One of the best in the world. Yeah, they're incredible. Um, But you do give up something. Like we were talking about Marshmallow earlier. I think he's a great example, that whole team, the way they kind of upended the industry. You know, they they turned down multi-million dollar record deals to stay independent and just, you know, put out this string of singles on their own. And he's number one on Forbes. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah, it's insane. Insane. You know, and, and like that investment and that confidence in his project, you know, whether that came from him or from Moshe Lizzy or yeah. anyone, like that decision to me was so ballsy. Because, I mean, God, can you imagine turning down millions of dollars? But knowing that you're going to kill it. Right, that's the thing. You imagine know? if he took it and he was just stuck in like a... <sighs> I say I say it like it's it's pennies, right? like being stuck in like a million dollar deal. Right. And look at him now. It's like well, exactly. Yeah. I mean, you know, we are talking on a scale, though. You know, say he took a, a million dollar deal, he would have lost, you know, lost out on whatever tens of millions yeah. he's got now. It's crazy. Know? It's wild. And rights as well. Yes. Like all the like, like people don't realize it, but like sync and like yeah, radio play and like YouTube plays, all of that you lose out on. Yep. And that's. That's probably the most lucrative part of of releasing music now because no one buys music anymore. Right, yeah, it's all off the streams. Yeah, like yeah. I, I've earned more off my free downloads than I have from like sold singles and yep. EPs. Yep. And that, that's scary. It's, it's a delicate balance. I think that's why you see a lot of artists who will put out a couple records or a couple EPs with some of the bigger labels, but once they blow up, they all of them just start self-releasing. Yeah. And the people who do stick with the, the labels have been there from the start. It's never yeah. been like like Zomboy and Never Say Die. Right. Zomboy fucking kills it on every level, but he still never say die just because they you know, all the boats rise with the water, like yeah. everyone stayed together. Very true, man. And and shout out to all the labels too, because yeah. we as much as we shit on you guys, we really need you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we're your friends as well. Don't <laughs> don't look at us like business partners. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, this has been cool, man. Uh, yeah. anything else you want to get out there? I mean, we talked a little bit about it, but in in the short term, anything people should be looking out for? I'm going on tour soon, hyperfuturetour.com with must die and lax. That's going to be crazy. That'll be fun. Yeah, I really get on with those guys. Lax is one of my favorite, favorite people yeah. ever. And Lee as well, must I? Like, yeah, he's just... He's odd. I don't know him as well, but I really like very him Very similar. Lot. Very yeah. similar to, to me and you. Just wants to chill. Yeah. And I appreciate that. I don't, I don't like party goers. I don't, I don't click with people like that. Have you ever toured with like a crazy party or just somebody whose personality was like oh, I very play, different? I've, I've played shows and I've just ended up on my phone on Reddit. Yeah. Just <laughs> upvoting shit. I don't like that. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's pretty much it really. Just going hard with the shows this year. All right, man. Well, this has been awesome. Looking forward to what you do this year, dude. Back to back to back to back. Yeah. Boom, boom, I'm going to remake the theme song. Yo. I'm going to do it. Fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's the show. Shout out to Tosoki for sitting down with me. I really enjoyed having you over. Shout out to everybody out there listening, whether you're at home, at the gym, in the car, anywhere. If you're hearing my voice right now, I appreciate you. My name is Willie Joy. You can reach me at backtobackpod at gmail.com or at backtobackpod or at Willie Joy on all social media. That's it for this week. Go check out our Spotify playlist, catch up on all the new music over there, and I will talk to you guys next Tuesday. For Back to Back, this is Willie Joy. Have a good one, guys. Peace. (laughs) 